If you live with diabetes, your doctor has probably told you to exercise more, eat fewer carbs, and maybe take medication to manage your blood sugar levels. But did they mention that alcohol can lower blood sugar too? It can, I'm not kidding. In fact, I've discovered even more surprising ways to reduce blood glucose. So in this video, I'll cover what these things are, how effective each one is, and whether they are safe for long-term use. And trust me, you will love the last one. It's been a game changer for me. Let's go. Now you might be wondering, Tom, where did you find these unexpected things that lower your blood sugar? Well, I discovered a paper from a guy called Adam Brown. And in this paper, he summarizes factors that impact our blood glucose. These factors come from scientific research, conversations with experts, and his personal experience of 18 years with diabetes. Now I've been managing my diabetes for twice that time. I've been wearing a continuous glucose monitor monitor for 60,000 hours and I've experienced every single one of those factors that he's describing here. Except for one, the menstrual cycle. Anyway, I can tell you that Adam is spot on. So let's dive in and talk about what I found in this paper. Starting with the first unexpected thing that lowers blood sugar, meal timing. Adam found that eating a large late night dinner often results in high overnight blood sugars, over 180 milligrams per deciliter, especially if his dinner is high in carbs and fat. But when he eats a lighter, earlier dinner, his overnight blood sugar numbers stay in the optimal range between 70 and 140 milligrams per deciliter. I've been experiencing with the timing of my dinner as well, and I've seen very similar results. That's why I usually try to eat dinner before 7 p.m. and keep late night snacking to a minimum. My usual dinner consists primarily of whole foods, rich in both protein and fiber. But it's okay for me to introduce some complex carbohydrates and healthy fats too. Here are some blood sugar friendly foods I often have for dinner. As you can see, these are mostly vegetables, legumes, whole grains, lean meats, eggs, and some healthy fats. Eating a light early dinner really works. It's something that can be implemented very easily and it works in the long term. So I approve. Next up, number nine, is alcohol. Now before I tell you if it's a good idea to drink alcohol or not to lower your blood sugar, let's talk about the mechanics how alcohol can lower blood glucose. As Adam describes in his paper, normally your liver releases glucose into your bloodstream. But when you drink alcohol, the liver is busy breaking down the alcohol, reducing its output of glucose. This can lead to a drop in blood sugar levels for several hours after you've had a drink, especially if the alcohol was consumed on an empty stomach. But be careful, as many alcoholic drinks include other ingredients, like carbohydrate-rich mixers. Those can spike blood sugar really quickly. So should you drink alcohol to lower your blood sugar levels? Well, that's really up to you. But I can't really officially approve it here, because alcohol has other negative health implications whenever you overdo it. But if you have a drink or two at a party, I won't blame you. Just check your blood sugar more often and do it responsibly. By the way, my favorite drink is whiskey with lots of ice and Diet Coke. But don't tell anyone, okay? Moving on to the next unexpected thing that will lower your blood sugar. Number eight. And this one really surprised me. Adam points out that even small tweaks in our environment can significantly impact the choices we make. And our choices directly impact our blood glucose, especially when they are related to eating and insulin dosing. One small tweak he mentions is the size of the plates and bowls we use in our kitchen. He claims that the same food on a smaller plate looks more filling than on a bigger plate. When you use a smaller plate or smaller bowl, you end up eating fewer carbohydrates and your blood sugar won't spike as high. To be quite honest, I didn't really believe that the size of my plate could have such an impact. So I decided to test this myself in my favorite buffet restaurant. I did this for about two or three months. But I noticed that whenever I use a smaller plate, I really ended up eating less and even paying less. <laughs> The smaller portion made it easier for me to estimate the number of carbs in that meal and dose my insulin more accurately. So how big should your plate be? Well, Adam recommends switching to an 8-inch dinner plate and filling half of each plate with vegetables. And I have to say that when I followed his tip, my glucose almost never spiked over 140. So I approve. Next thing that will lower blood sugar kind of unexpectedly, number seven, is something that anyone can do. It's not only simple, it's actually easy. 
I love those. Adam has found that his glucose was the highest on days when he didn't sleep enough. He noticed that on these days he needed nearly 25% more insulin and his blood glucose was 21% more variable. Now I didn't measure this quite as precisely as he did, but I can confirm that whenever I don't get a good night's sleep, my blood sugar is typically elevated on the following day and I see a lot more spikes, especially after breakfast and other meals. Now these findings align with many diabetes studies, which have found that lack of sleep leads to not only higher blood sugars, but insulin resistance, weight gain, increased food intake, and more carb cravings. So what can we do about it? Well, it's quite simple, sleep more. I aim for at least seven hours a day, but eight, is really the optimal number for me. I definitely approve of this tip. Moving on to the next unexpected thing that can lower your blood sugar, outside temperature. Adam refers to a scientific review on body temperature regulation in diabetes. This review summarizes a lot of research, including evidence that cold exposure can improve insulin sensitivity in type 2 diabetes. I don't have type 2 diabetes, I have type 1, but from my experience I can confirm that cold weather usually drives my blood glucose down. And many of my friends living with diabetes experience this as well. Adam notes that this might be related to our bodies having to work harder to stay warm when it's cold outside, and that this lowers glucose. And by the way, I approve of cold exposure. It's something I like to do. On the other hand, I noticed that hot weather makes my blood sugar more stubborn and I typically need more insulin to stay in the optimal range when it's hot outside. But what's really fascinating is that some people living with diabetes report the exact opposite. They say that sitting in the sun, taking a hot shower or hot bath brings their blood sugar down. And Adam points to a blog post from Dr. Dickinson we suggest that the blood vessels dilation from heat might be responsible for the drop in their blood glucose. So what should you do? Should you take a cold shower or sit in the sun? Well, it seems that everyone is different and what works for me or Adam might not work for you. And that's why I think it's worth getting curious and start experimenting to find what's best for you. Moving on to number five, and I have a feeling this one will be controversial because many people in the diabetes community who achieve great blood sugar control are on a low carb diet. And I've had my fair share of experience with this diet too. It worked for me very well for many years. But there is something in this paper that reminded me why low carb diet is not sustainable for me in the long run. When I was on low carb diet, most of my energy came from fats. But as Adam mentions in his paper, fatty foods tend to make people with diabetes more insulin resistant. You often need more insulin to cover the same amount of food that's high in fat relative to a similar meal without the fat. And similar applies to protein. Adam knows that even with a carb-free protein-only meal, he needs insulin to cover the slow rise in blood sugar from protein. I've confirmed this myself. High fat meals and animal protein make me more insulin resistant, causing my blood sugar to creep up over time. And that's why the surprising thing that make my blood sugar control easier was eating more good carbs regularly. The more good carbs I add to my meal plan, the more insulin sensitive I get and the less insulin I need to cover those carbs. It's counterintuitive, but it works. But there is a catch. The carbs I'm talking about are not just any carbs. This probably won't work with white bread, white rice, pasta, or any highly processed carbs. Because I'm talking about the carbs that are not processed. Whole grains, legumes, starchy vegetables, fruits, things like that. You'll see that when you add a moderate amount of these on your plate, you will become more insulin sensitive. Your blood sugar will go down over time and good control will become easier. Now, if you're hesitant to start eating more carbs, I completely understand. I would encourage you to start with those with lower glycemic index and avoid those that have high glycemic index. It will make it a lot more easier for you. By the way, I have many other videos on my channel, which will help you make the right choice. Next up, number four. And this one will be really critical if you are serious about improving your blood sugar control. So please listen up. Adam says that what ensures he's driving his diabetes safely are frequent blood sugar checks. The more he tests, the better he can steer his glucose back into the optimal range whenever he's going high or low. Glucose data also provides him useful feedback 
on what he did well or what to do differently next time. It doesn't matter if you use a CGM or do finger pricks. Studies show that more frequent testing leads to lower HbA1c and higher timing range, which are the typical benchmarks for good control. Now, while I agree with Adam and all these studies, I want to add one more thing that I believe is super important. See, whenever your blood sugar reading is not what you would like it to be, it's really easy to start blaming yourself. Saying something like, I'm a bad diabetic, I messed up again, I shouldn't have eaten that. But please don't do that. There is no good or bad blood sugar. It's just information. I want you to slow down, take that piece of information and learn from it. Get curious and start asking questions. Something like, hmm, why does my blood sugar spike so high every time I eat a big plate of pasta? What can I do differently next time? Should I eat less pasta, go for a walk after dinner, take more insulin, make a different sauce, buy a different pasta brand, take my insulin earlier. The goal of frequent blood sugar checks is to understand your body and to make better decisions, not to beat yourself up. Moving on to the next unexpected thing that can lower your blood sugar, time of day. Adam found that morning exercise drops his blood sugar less compared to afternoon or evening exercise, likely due to higher insulin resistance in the morning. And I'm the same, I'm more insulin resistant in the morning. When I eat a big carby breakfast, it will spike my blood sugar a lot more than a big carby dinner. Now you might be saying, okay Tom, that's great, but what do I do with this information? How will it help me lower my blood sugar? Well, let me tell you what I do with this information. And this might inspire you. I found that being more active in the morning helps me balance those stubborn blood sugars. So what I do is I park a few blocks away from my office and I walk and I take the stairs. I don't take the elevator. I also started eating less in the morning, which keeps my blood sugar more stable in the AM. On the other hand, in the afternoon, when my blood sugar tends to be lower, I don't do that much physical activity. And I know that if I want to sneak in an ice cream, afternoon is the best time to do that. Another thing I do is that I inject a bit more insulin for the same amount of carbs in the morning relative to the afternoon. I use a lower insulin to carb ratio and this helps me keep my blood sugar pretty much straight line throughout the day. So I agree with Adam on this point as well. Time of day really matters. Now your day might be different from mine, but when you check your blood sugar frequently, see the previous point, you might be able to find patterns and to make those little tweaks that will lead to giant peaks and good blood sugar control for you. Next up, number two, is something we hardly think about in connection with our blood sugar levels, family relationships and social pressures. In his paper, Adam refers to a psychologist who found a link between diabetes distress and blood sugar outcomes. She claims that high levels of family conflict are often linked to higher blood sugar levels and HbA1c levels in people with diabetes. And I've seen this myself. During challenging family times, my stress levels go up and my blood sugar spikes. So I completely agree with this point. But I would also like to share with you how I deal with this kind of things. I found that in the long run, it's worth to spend more time with my family members and work on those relationships to help create good atmosphere. Of course, this can be stressful sometimes, but I realized that being present and mindful in those moments really helped reduce the stress. Now, Adam also mentions that social pressures might impact our decisions. For instance, I usually eat a balanced healthy lunch, but when I'm invited to my aunt who makes lasagna and apple pie, I kind of need to eat a big plate of it to make her happy. Now, obviously these kind of meals will be a lot more difficult to handle from the blood sugar perspective, but you know what? I prioritize my blood sugar 99% of the time. So it's okay for me to eat apple pie once in a while. And as I mentioned in my previous videos, there are many strategies how to keep your blood sugar under control while eating these unhealthy foods. So if you didn't see my previous videos, definitely subscribe and check them out. Now, before I get to the number one thing on my list, if you want to ask me any questions, the best place to do that is my Patreon. I respond to every single message from my patrons and you can also access bonus content and community calls. The spots in my Patreon group are limited, but I checked today and we still have a few spots left. 
So go ahead and join while you still can. But now, moving on to number one thing on my list. This one has such a profound impact on my overall blood sugar control. And I have to admit that I had no idea how important this thing was until I started doing this regularly. If you live with diabetes and take any medication, you probably know that the dose of the medication you take is super important because it directly impacts your blood glucose. In most cases, a higher dose of medication lowers blood sugar more. But many people living with diabetes and even some healthcare professionals don't realize that medication timing can also be critical. As Adam points out in his paper, taking rapid-acting insulin like Humaloc or Novoloc 20 minutes before a meal is ideal for him. Whenever he allows this extra 20 minutes for the insulin to kick in, it leads to a lower spike in his glucose versus when he starts eating right away. Now, I personally use rapid-acting insulin, so I typically only need to wait 10 to 15 minutes, but I completely agree with Adam's point. I know that whenever I inject my insulin, I don't wait, I eat right away, my blood sugar will just spike to the moon. And that used to happen to me a lot when I was young and stupid. By the way, Adam also knows that timing of many type 2 diabetes medications matter a lot too. Some can consistently be taken at any time of day, while others like metformin are most optimally taken at meals. Now please keep in mind that the optimal timing of your medication might be different from mine. It depends on what kind of meal you eat, what kind of insulin you use, and many other factors. But the thing is, I created a list with 30 so-called blood sugar hacks that I use to keep my blood sugar under control. I won't cover those 30 hacks today, but if you want to know what they are, just click on this video and watch it next. I guarantee that those hacks will take your blood sugar game to the next level. So I will see you in that video. Ciao!